That was study number 20 from Fernando Soares Opus 60. And you probably already have the sheet music somewhere, so just follow the lesson for free and pick up all the tips. But if you don't, I do have an edition of all 25 of Soares Opus 60 etudes, so there's a link for that in the description. So as Soar mentions in this piece, um, part of the um, etude aspect of this work is keeping a finger down while other fingers um, navigate the other notes. And indeed, there are a number of places in this piece where you really do kind of keep a finger down for an extended period of time as things occur around it. So it's an interesting study in that regard. But on, on another level, um, you know, in B minor, it's just a really, really nice piece. I like the way it sounds. I like how he's integrated um, the, the slurs and the arpeggios in this work. And there's just some moments in it that are just really um, pleasant melodically and harmonically too. So a really enjoyable piece, but also a pedagogical aspect to cover. So um, let's, let's go over it a little bit, but really probably one of my favorite pieces. And as we get into the later um, studies in this Opus 60, uh, they're getting a little bit more advanced, but they're also getting very musically satisfying and a little bit, a little bit longer and more um, complex. So um, there are melodic lines that weave their way through these arpeggio patterns, particularly in the bass parts later, uh, but not so much that I would necessarily play them on their own. Uh, maybe I would play some of them at bar nine, but even then, even, even then, I, I, I don't know. I, I think that um, you want to think melodically, but it's all going to be intertwined with the arpeggios and the texture in this case. So I think we'll just go over the piece, uh, but let's talk about that holding the finger down. Soar specifically mentions that you can use this study to keep a finger down while other notes um, are moving around it. And if you wanted, you could take this a really, you know, to an to a extreme where you keep your third finger down from bar one all the way to bar 17, pretty much. Um, but I actually break it up every once in a while at the ends of the phrase, just to lift the finger and to use my hand in a natural way. Um, sometimes I don't actually feel it's, it's that natural or, or pedagogically good to keep a finger down for that, that long, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a cool um, pedagogical idea that, and you should try it out, actually holding your third finger down from bar one to, to 17. But like I said, I do change it up every once in a while at the ends of the phrases just to, just to break it up a little bit. Let's keep our third finger down. You know, I kind of use my third finger when I get to that texture just to get some relief from holding it down, but feel free to use your fourth finger and hold it down even longer um, if you're holding this down. You could, you could leave it down the whole time. Um, I sometimes lift it off just at the cadences there or, or mid-phrase um, just to give a break to it. Um, and to make you know the end of the phrase there feel a little bit natural, but but if you want to go really for the pedagogical concept, uh, yeah, keep that finger down. Bar five, same thing. So you're just not lifting that third finger. Um, I do lift it here and just break it at the cadence because eventually you have to. But you could go further by using your fourth finger if you wished. Okay, um, bar nine. So you're generally keeping that, that third finger down still. I, um, I, I do lift it there just at the end of the phrase. Not really holding any finger down through this section so much. Yeah. Through here from 
from bar 25 on, or really bar 24 on, um, you're keeping your second finger down. You do have to switch to three here. But you can keep three down for quite some time. to the finet on the repeat there. So um, lots of opportunities uh, to keep your finger down for a really long time. Like technically you could keep it down from the very beginning all the way up to bar 16. But um, I, like I said, I, I do break it up every, just at the ends of some of the phrases there. Um, outside of that, you might have noticed I'm using my thumb for a lot of the down stem notes all through bar nine. Pretty much all the down stems are getting a thumb. And through this oddity bar, bar 12, he doesn't put the down stem on each note as he does previously, um, but I continue to treat that as a down stem there. And so just using my thumb, even if it goes up to the second string, like even at bar 17, my fingers on those inner voices but it kind of just feels natural to keep the thumb on the eighth note through there as I've done elsewhere in the piece uh, so just lots of, of, of thumb on on all of those bass notes throughout there and then on the on the second page it's, it's pretty straightforward arpeggio patterns when when he goes into an arpeggio at bar 38 I only use my thumb on the actual bass notes um, in the first section it's just alternating fingers and then thumb on the bass notes. So only on the down stems will I really use my thumb. So right hand fingering, might it might feel a little bit weird at first uh, to use so much of the thumb, but I, th I think it really simplifies the fingering of the piece and allows you to be consistent with the melodic line. Instead of having to sometimes play the thumb and sometimes with the fingers for that inner voice, um, you just use the thumb the whole time and it, it works out quite nicely. So it's a really beautiful piece, lots of pedagogical things you can cover there, uh, but uh, also just one of the, the, the pieces I definitely like more from the Opus 60.